So thank you, Nigel, for telling everybody it's lunchtime now. <laughs> and I was already really nervous before this session. Um, not so much because of you as an audience. You look all very friendly and probably have some nice questions, but that's all, that's all fine, right? Um, not because of Martin, who basically made it impossible to present as a, uh, as a vendor um, without you know, being called a liar. My work is done. Yeah. <laughs> They should put you at the end of the day, right? <laughs> Makes it a little bit less stressful for, uh, for vendors to, uh, to present. Um, but the real reason for being nervous is Enrico's mail that I was reading yesterday, and he mentioned he wanted to have some interaction during the presentation. And I was like, holy crap, how am I going to do that? Um, because I had like 20, 25 slides for 25 minutes. It's a bit, it's a bit on the edge because, you know, um, Martin mentioned, you know, hundreds of slides and, you know, being able to present those in a short amount of time and then basically taking some time off by walking, you know, the, the plant or whatever. Uh, so you're basically left with only a couple of minutes to actually get the message across. So what I did is I deleted most of my slides. I have probably five left, uh, which this is one of. So I wanted to thank you for, uh, for hanging in uh, just before lunch. I know. <laughs> uh, the magic wand I put up there because uh, I've done quite a few presentation trainings, even if you can't tell. Uh, and they're all actually about what Martin was talking about. It's countering his presentation. So I was like, holy shit, if I only had paid attention during those, right? Um, so yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try to get it started. So the real reason why I'm nervous is because I only have a couple of slides and I want to get a message across. Sometimes I use like 100 slides and still not capable of getting the message across. You know, you present for an hour, hour and a half, you're really enthusiastic about it. And then at the end, people come up to you and say, so what is it that you do? <sighs> Damn, I must be really, really bad at this. <laughs> but still, I'm here, so let's get this thing started. So if you can take away one thing from this presentation, please let it be that if you are really bored someday during a presentation of a vendor, for instance, Try this URL, it's try.tintree.com, and it will show you what we do and what it is that we try to sell to the world. Uh, it's um, Carl, the storage guy, is, uh, is on that side as well. He's a really funny dude. If you don't know him, look him up on Twitter. Uh, so he's always, uh, he has some smart things to say sometimes. So the real uh, title of the presentation was What Goes Where? And Actually, I think it fits nicely in between some of the presentations I've seen so far. Because Tintree is a storage provider, right? There's a lot of storage vendors here. Um, so we sell storage. What we've done is we started out with a hybrid array. And when I talk about hybrid, I mean the combination of flash and disk. Not so much different kinds of flash, so a hybrid array. Recently, we also announced an all flash array, which makes it a little bit more difficult when you go visit a customer. Because what are you going to talk about, right? Are you going to talk about the all flash or are you going to talk about the hybrid? So there's a lot of hype and a lot of marketing around all flash. Does it solve all your problems? I'm not really sure. So I was really happy with Enrico's presentation earlier this morning because he stated, you know, people want performance, but they also want low cost. Basically, that's why hybrid storage arrays exist. Um, but you have to be really smart about how you implement a hybrid storage array. So one slide on the technique behind the Tintry storage uh, solution that we're trying to sell. And it goes back in history. It shows you basically silos where people used to be at. Uh, so you have an application. Um, it's called App1. It used to say SAP or Exchange or anything like that. And what you would do is you would buy the right compute, you know, the, the right amount of compute, add an operating system. Could be Windows, could be Linux or Unix. And then you have the right storage for a specific application. Now, one of the big advantages of having these kind of silos is that you can actually optimize them and tune them for a specific workload, right? Um, so if you buy Linux for SAP and you buy Windows for Exchange, you get an optimized silo. There's a couple of downsides to this as well, obviously. The costs are pretty high, uh, and you need to ma uh, maintain a lot of knowledge about the different solutions and about the different components. So where are we today? That's the middle picture, basically. And that's where we introduced fertilization to the mix. We are moving to x86 hardware 
a software, <coughs> sorry. And we have basically a, a farm of compute. We have a farm of storage or a big pool of storage. And we've put a hypervisor in between, right? So what are we doing? We're virtualizing applications, we're virtualizing operating systems, and we're virtualizing hardware. And we've called that the I.O. Blender. Actually, I don't think we actually made it up ourselves. I think Stephen Foskett started with that. Uh, so the hypervisor is acting as an I.O. Blender. So it's very hard to optimize the storage pool for the applications that are running on it. So how do you solve this? Actually, that's what Tintree is trying to do. What we've done is we've created a storage solution. So Tintree is a storage vendor. And it has its own operating system and it has its own file system. What happens if you put a virtual machine on our storage solution, the machine will actually recognize, hey, there's a new workload on the file system. And it will try to integrate with the hypervisor manager. This could be you know, VMware, vCenter. It could be um, Microsoft's Hyper-V. It can be OpenStack. It can be any of the uh, well-known hypervisors. What it will do is it will identify these files on our file system are actually these virtual disks in your virtualized environment. And these virtual disks together form a certain amount of virtual machines. So the management object in a Tintree environment is no longer a LUN or a volume or anything like that. It's the virtual machine and the virtual disks. Now, by having this kind of intelligence, this kind of integration, you can do some really clever things. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what the whole philosophy is about. It's about the managing the VM instead of learns and volumes. Now, what we can do is we can give you statistics and performance information based on a VM or on a VDisk, really detailed information as well. We provide you end-to-end -end performance information. So not just from the storage layer, but also through the network and the host. But also we are capable of doing things like snapshotting, cloning, and replication at the VM level. <coughs> so everything is aimed at the VM level. Also, uh, I think it was Howard who mentioned quality of services, you know, basically a really interesting concept. We do that at the VM level as well. So why does this matter? Why is it important um, to be able to manage at the VM level? That's because there's a lot of pressure on IT environments. Obviously, virtualization has put a lot of pressure, pressure on it because of the randomness of the IOs. <coughs> the bottleneck becomes storage quite often. There's the cloud, the whole cloud story. Actually, when I was listening to the, to the panel, I got a little bit worried again, even more, because there's so many you know, acronyms and software defined is always brought up. There's this, you know, all these acronyms. And sometimes I'm, I'm really wondering, do I even know what these mean? <laughs> and it made me think of the OpenStack Benelux conference we had last week. I think there was five, 600 people there. And I talked to a lot of them before my presentation. There was actually a, a crowd a little bit bigger than this. And I started talking to some of them before the presentation. And I went like, so what are you doing here? Why are you here at this conference? And I think at least 75% of, uh, of the people answered, I'm here to find out what OpenStack is. And that made me think like, holy crap. If I talk about storage, if I talk about VMs, maybe a lot, there's a lot of people there that don't even know what I'm talking about. So that makes life pretty hard. Uh, but at the OpenStack conference, uh, that question was not answered. So there was a lot of technical detailed sessions <coughs> and the presenters all assumed that everybody knew what OpenStack was about and what it was for. So really interesting day for me and it really set me uh, you know, thinking about what I am presenting to customers. So hybrid cloud and cloud in general puts a lot of pressure on IT as well because that's why, where you're being compared with nowadays. It used to be, you know, we are virtualizing unless there's a real good reason not to virtualize. Today it's we're moving to the cloud unless there's a real good reason not to for a lot of companies. Um, so that's what you're being compared to. And one of the, the main things there is same day delivery, right? You go to a website, you say, I need this amount of virtual machines, I need these specs, and boom, they're there. And then the third thing is flash because everybody knows you can go to any of the well-known uh, shops out here, buy a flash drive for $200 or euros, and it solves all your problems, right? So why wouldn't that happen in an IT environment? Just buy a lot of flash and it will solve all your problems. That's what people are thinking about. A Couple of years back it was, if I drive to my, com to my favorite computer shop, I can buy a SCSI disk or a USB drive for 100 euros, and I have this amount of capacity. 
Now you're here, Mr. Storage Vendor, and you're trying to sell me a really, really expensive array. Why? So this is the new situation here. So Flash is solving all your problems, right? <coughs> what we are saying is we should do things differently. Because people with conventional storage are spending their time, you know, basically creating LUNs, uh, managing the zoning of their fiber channel network. Um, scalability is a big issue. We've, we've heard a couple of presentations surrounding that. And also predictability, especially with the hybrid array. Since we're selling a hybrid array uh, most of the time, uh, predictability can be an issue because people say, we have this large database, we have this large data set, and we want to have consistent performance throughout the whole data set. So that's one of the reasons why we actually release an all flash array. So then the question becomes, where should I put my data? So that was my title of the presentation. Um, I'll just skip these. For me, it is choosing between creamy and crunchy peanut butter, basically. Normal peanut butter is really, really good. I like it a lot. But the crunchy one is just a little bit better. Depends on what you're looking for, right? So back at the Tentry headquarters, somebody really clever at marketing created this slide and says, you know, the majority of the virtualized workloads should go on hybrid. And I actually agree with that. But there is some exceptions, and they should go on all flash. Since we haven't had a lot of interaction yet, I was really wondering if somebody could make up a use case for all flesh besides the couple that are up there. Any ideas? It's a tough one, I know. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So big working set, that's basically it. Now, one of the really cool things about the Tintree solution since we are VM aware and we actually know what a VM is and we can determine things per virtual machine, is that what we do is for every individual virtual machine that you put on, put on a Tintree appliance, we will analyze <coughs> the working set. So for every VM, if you put 10 on the system or you put 1,000 or 5,000 on one system, for every individual virtual workload, we will determine what is the working set. And the working set is basically the definition of what is active data within a working set or within a, a workload. Um, and what we will do is we will make sure that every virtual machine will have its most active data on the flash layer in a hybrid array. So only cold data should reside on the spinning media. This way we can get low latency and a high flash hit ratio. So when you talk about uh, storage being hybrid storage, a lot of vendors will go, yeah, yeah, we'll make sure that the most active data will reside on flash. But what they are doing is they are looking at the total data set. So if you have let's say 20 terabytes of data, they will look from this 20 terabytes of data, what is the most active data, and they will put that on the highest performing tier. Could be that you have one really large virtual machine, which is very active, and then all its data will be seen as the most active data and reside on flash. All your other VMs would be on the spinning media at that moment. What we will do is we'll make sure that every virtual machine, even if it's like a virtual desktop that only does 20 IOs a second, we'll make sure that the most used data of this virtual desktop will be on flash as well. So every virtual machine will get great performance, low latency. So that's a big differentiator. So of course, if there's a hybrid array, there's only a certain amount of flash in this hybrid array, right? If your data set is actually larger than the amount of flash in the array, it's very hard to start predicting uh, <coughs> consistent performance. Obviously, we will do things like inline deduplication and inline compression, so we can actually expand the amount of data that will uh, fit on flash. But if you even go behind, beyond that, uh, that's when we would advise to go all flash. Now, Tintree is all about simplicity and taking away the management burden of your storage infrastructure. Now we basically created a new one, having hybrids and all flash. So which workload should go where? And that's why we are now starting to talk about VM scale-out. Basically what we do, since the VM is our management object, we can monitor each individual VM we do this by a product called Tintree Global Center. And what it will do is it will monitor all the virtual workloads, but it will also monitor the underlying appliances. Each appliance can report on the capacity it has and how much capacity is being used, but it can also report on the amount of resources it has and how much resources are still available. So basically how much performance you can expect from a certain array. With VM Scaleout, what we'll do is we'll monitor all the entities in your IT environment and then make really smart decisions about which workloads should reside where. 
So if you have VMs that are showing a lot of latency coming from the storage side because it's larger than the working set that will fit in flash, the system could basically automatically determine maybe this is a good candidate to be moved to flash, to the all flash array, and then get consistent latency, right? So that's just one of the things. Of course, if there's a lot of appliances and some of them are over flooded with workloads, others might have uh, not that many, uh, five minutes still, and this is my last slide, Enrico. You promised me a lot of interaction. <laughs> so the idea is an optimized and a an balanced environment, basically. So like I said, this is my last slide. I was really curious if somebody has any questions, Nigel? I have a question. Sure. I don't know if I missed you talking on it when I stepped out, but um, how are you going to be impacted by VVOLs? VVOLs, well, that's, I wouldn't say my favorite question, but. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my favorite one is the software-defined one because I have no clue what that is about. <laughs> so VVOLs, yeah, really good question. Obviously, VMware has been talking about VVOLs for a very, very long time, right? Uh, and what I've been told, I, haven't, I don't have any experience myself, but what I've been told that the amount of VVOLs that certain storage arrays will support is pretty limited. And you actually need quite a few VVOLs if you have a normal-sized IT environment. So there's going to be a mismatch there in the number of VVOLs that you will need and the number of VVOLs that your traditional storage vendor can support. So we've said uh, from day one, we will support VVOLs next to the functionality that we offer today. Uh, but basically, the promise of VVOLs, we have had since 2011. So all the functionality that VVOLs is promising, we have had in our system since the first release. Doing things like you know, analytics and statistics per VM or per VVOL, um, having the uh, ability to snapshot, clone, and replicate at the VM level, rather than doing it at the learn or volume level, we've had that since day one. Is it not a challenge to your business, though, the fact that VVOLs are now on the horizon and potentially going to be doing the kind of stuff that you, granted, have been doing it since 2011? Yeah, so we, we get this question quite often, and I mean, it's a good question, right? Because the promise is there that it will solve a lot of these problems. Uh, but the reality is that if you look, and we actually have a slide on it, but I didn't want to bring it up, so it's one of those that I deleted. But if you look at, um, the functionality that VVOLs will offer, it's pretty limited if you look at the total VMware solution, right? So VVOLs will give you some advantages, but it, for instance, will not allow you to replicate a VVOL. And there's a lot of compatibility issues. So there's a lot of things that VVOLs will do, but there's also a lot of things that VVOLs will not do. It will not be able to integrate with Site Recovery Manager, for instance. A lot of these things uh, that people rely on and like or well, maybe SRM is not the best example there, but. <laughs> so a lot of things that people rely on will not be supported with VVOLs in the first release, and it might be the second, the third, or the fifth release. We have no clue. So this, even though it has been talked about for years and years now, before it's a fully functional solution, it might take even much more time. Sure, so good question. The question is, uh, uh, from a software-defined perspective, uh, do you support policy-based management, basically, right, and automated management? Um, so all the functionality of the appliance is available via our uh, RESTful API, so everything can be scripted, right? We provide PowerShell command lines, things like that. So everything can be scripted. Uh, obviously, having a RESTful API also allows third-party vendors to integrate with our solution. Then again, we have Tintree Global Center, which is our uh, management tool, which allows you to set policies at the VM level, uh, but it also allows you to set policies at a group level. So basically what you could do is you, create, uh, you can create a service group, as we call it, and this is just a group of VMs that can be spread across multiple appliances, multiple Tintree appliances, and you can set policy at that level. Um, we see Tintree Global Center as our, basically as our management backplane. Today, the functionality is uh, more focused towards monitoring and configuring things, uh, but in the near future, this will definitely evolve to uh, policy-based management and automation. Yeah. Any other questions? Any final questions? What about Hyper-V? Yeah, so we support Hyper-V. Uh, we are actually uh, Azure Stack or Azure Pack or whatever it's called these days uh, certified as well. Uh, we support SEN Server in the near future. Uh, today, we support OpenStack. Um, so we try to aim uh, and uh, uh, basically support all the major hypervisors. And From a VMware versus Hyper-V perspective, though, um, what, are there any like gaping holes in the portfolio when it comes to Hyper-V versus what you can do for VMware? 
So we started, uh, so the question is basically, is the, is the functionality on par between the two, right? Um, so good question. We started off with VMware, so all the functionality that we have today was aimed at VMware. Uh, and with new hypervisors, it's basically catching up. We do a phased release. Um, so Hyper-V is pretty much on par, on par with uh, what we do for VMware. Uh, there's just some things that are not capable of, uh, Hyper-V is not capable of, right? So we need obviously the support of the hypervisor itself as well. Uh, but yeah, we are on par uh, from a functionality perspective between Hyper-V and VMware. It's a different, you know, it's a different qu uh, question if you ask it for, uh, for OpenStack and other hypervisors. But we are definitely doing a phased approach there and try to have the same fun functionality across uh, all of them. So the mention of OpenStack and other hypervisors, do you have anything um, on the long-term roadmap for containers? I knew you <laughs> would bring that <this> up. <laughs> So uh, during uh, my last media training, they told me, you know, um, point somebody out that is uh, allowed to talk about this, but the answer is yes. Okay. And I can inform you about this uh, offline, basically. Okay. Yeah, so it's definitely, definitely going to happen, uh, which brings up a lot of uh, interesting questions like the portability of a VM or a container, basically, versus that of a VM. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to getting more information on that. But I'm, uh, Chris? Right. So if it extends to other hypervisors, then the same logic applies. So if it extends to containers, the same logic applies. And I'm looking here for a yes, no in principle answer, if it's possible for you to give one. So I have no idea what the question is, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. So yeah, that's that's really interesting and also really dangerous because scary. yeah, it's it's scary, right? So one of the things that we face every day is that we go present to prospects and we're there with the storage team and the virtualization team, right? When we talk, start talking about simplicity and the ease of management and the VMware guys go like, holy crap, this is gonna give me so much potential and so many things that I can do, right? And then the storage team goes like, nah, it's toys for boys, we're not gonna do it. It's nothing to manage, there's no loans, there's no rate sets, so why would we even want this, right? So it's basically talking to the goose uh, at Christmas and things like that. Um, the same applies now with the virtualization team, because if you take this even further, and the developers might not necessarily uh, be part of the uh, virtualization team, if they could manage it themselves, you know. So this is an ongoing uh, thing. I think it will, uh, it will remain with the uh, virtualization team or the storage team, primarily. But we can definitely give them hook-ins hook to you know, our system so that they can snapshot themselves or clone really easily and you know, restore snapshots, things like that pretty easily. Um, but yeah, for now I think we'll stick to the storage teams and the virtualization teams for management. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So once again, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, come over there, we'll be there. Thank you. Thank you.